Hi everyone, thanks so much uh, for coming to the next installment of the UCL Dark Invited Speaker Series. Today we're hearing from Yan Dong Tian uh, on the topic of finding good representations for search and exploration in reinforcement learning. Uh, Yuan Dong is a research scientist and manager in Facebook AI research, working on deep reinforcement learning and representation learning. He's the lead scientist and engineer for the ELF, OpenGo and Dark Forest Go projects. Prior to that, he was in the Google self-driving car team from 2013 to 2014. And prior to that, he, re he received a PhD from the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon University uh, in 2013. I'm really looking forward to what you have to say to us today, Yuan Dong, so over to you. Yeah, I think uh, uh, yeah, Robert, you have already covered uh, the majority of it. Yeah, so my name is Yuan Dong Tian. I'm from Facebook. I'm a research scientist and manager uh, in uh, FAIR. And also, thanks very much for uh, Ad and team to uh, introducing me and uh, invite me to be here to give a talk. So today, the topic is uh, to find a good representation for uh, search and exploration in reinforcement learning. Uh, so let me start with the first slides. And the first slide basically always showed that, oh yeah, there's a great improved success for uh, deep models. Now uh, we have seen it for like a lot of different places. Uh, so we see like uh, in games, right, in reinforced learning, we see like with deep models, uh, the, the performance getting uh, super good and it's getting super performance, super human performance in uh, multiple uh, games, right? And also in CV and NLP, we see like uh, the model that is being deployed is being substantially better than uh, this pre-deep model, deep learning uh, era, right? So, and uh, uh, behind all that, I mean, there's uh, one thing that is actually changed Right, so between uh, this uh, uh, before and after this deep learning era, right? So before deep learning era, what happens is people just say, okay, let's just use linear regression. So with linear regression, uh, you have a features and you you engineer the features, and then hopefully with one layer network, and uh, you want to use that features to predict the final outputs. Why, right? So what really changes uh, after this deep learning era is uh, we start to use deep models. So what do we mean by deep models? So we just stack like a bunch of layers and uh, between the input outputs. Uh, and then, and hopefully like uh, during this training, then this uh, intermediate layers, we actually learn good representations uh, so that this representation can be better used uh, to predict uh, the final output Y. Right, so that's basically like the, 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 the I think like it's like a one sentence uh, summarize, summarization to, to, to summarize like what's happening before and after the different era. So I think people might wonder like why that's the case, right? So there's one component which is called uh, why, deep, why representation learning can actually help. So we have a bunch of works, uh, but we're going to skip here because uh, in this talk, we're going to focus on uh, representation learning in uh, reinforcement learning. And uh, so in this topic, there's a lot of uh, papers uh, that is on that direction, but mostly uh, they are focused on, focusing on like a, a several concrete topics, right? So the first topic is like, uh, what is the state representation, right? So in this topic, we can have seen like uh, many papers. So for example, like this one is uh, the very famous, the Muzero paper. That paper basically uh, shows that if we can encode uh, the current state of, uh, of a game into a hidden state, and you can use that hidden state to do search and you can do branching until you find the interesting good policies to, to, to run. And you can basically train everything end to end. And recently we also see, uh, we can actually learn the representation uh, by combining the discrete and continuous loss functions and uh, to, uh, in order to basically like, uh, uh, have a good policy to master uh, Atari games. This is from uh, Google DeepMind, uh, sorry, from Google Red. So, and uh, we also see like a bunch of papers that can uh, aim for like learn the action representation, right? So in that case, uh, there could be the case that there, there are too many actions and you want to find the representation so that uh, you can uh, deal with these actions in a, a kind of uniform manner. And you might can also be able to transfer uh, from one action to uh, from one space of action to another space of action. Uh, so this you can be you can use that to transfer across different tasks. Uh, so this is being used extensively in, for example, recommender systems, in which uh, you might have a million of items to choose from. In that case, you might need to use action embeddings in order to get this to work. Right. And uh, but in, in this talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, other things, uh, not uh, uh, state or action representation, uh, but uh, something this more high level, right? So what I mean by high level 
is that uh, you actually want to have representation uh, for something that is bigger uh, than this just state and action uh, alone. Right, so there's a, a few examples uh, exactly uh, from the previous uh, uh, papers. So for example, you can use representation for the entire policy. Uh, so uh, that's actually one paper which is called Parrots from uh, this year's ICLEAR that shows that you can actually use representation to represent uh, the policy and the, the behavior policy and you can uh, transfer the behavior policy from existing tasks to new tasks. Right, so you can also learn representation of the environment so that uh, you can deal with the new task learning and such. So in this talk, I'm going to cover the three components. Uh, so we actually think about something that is actually different from all this and uh, to come up with like really nice, interesting solutions uh, for uh, different objects that you appear that happens in the reinforcement learning. So the, the, the talk will cover these three components. The first one is uh, how to learn representation of this entire action space. You can actually change the action space in order to get a better performance when you optimize a function using this MVP formulation. You can also find a different way to represent the value changes in imperfect information game so that the search becomes much more efficient and also uh, easier. And finally, we are, I'm talking about a little bit about this uh, ongoing work, which is basically uh, to study the representation changes uh, for a reinforcement exploration. And that's our very preliminary work. And we have like a few slides talking about the current progress. Okay, so let's start with the first uh, topic, which is the representation uh, for the uh, action space. So for this, uh, uh, I'm not uh, focusing on games, but uh, we are trying to think about uh, uh, more general optimization tasks. So in these tasks, uh, we basically deal with uh, uh, a hard optimization problem and you want to find a way to use reinforcement learning to solve them, right? So by optimization problems here, what I mean is uh, there's a bunch of like combinatorial optimization problems that we want to deal with, right? So for example, you have a objective function that to minimize the distance traveled uh, for a salesman. And then you basically want the salesman to travel uh, every city once and only once and come back to the original point. At the same time, you want the distance to be minimized, right? So you can also think about the job scaling problem, etc. So for all these optimization problems, I mean, they can be naturally formulated as uh, MDP uh, by uh, specific, properly specify, specifying where is the state and uh, where is the action, right? So and they can turn this entire thing into MDP, right? So, but the interesting part of this kind of uh, setting is that there exists like many MDPs uh, for a single uh, optimization problem. So it could be the case that uh, uh, we don't need to model this optimization problem as MDP at all. We just say, okay, let's do end-to-end -end training, right? So do one shot prediction. We gave in the problem specification, it's uh, basically um, provide you with solution in one shots. And you can also try other way of formulating it with different MDPs. Uh, you can say, okay, let's uh, predict one path after another until uh, you get a, is to get a complete solution. Or you can say, okay, let's start with um, uh, initial guess of the solution. And each step of the MDP becomes a refinement of uh, this solution until you cannot uh, get this solution uh, the, uh, better, right? So, and uh, finally, you can even try to learn what is the best way to uh, find the action space and so that this uh, entire MDP become easier to solve. So, so uh, from all these uh, examples, you can actually see that the representation actually really matters in terms of solving these optimization problems. Right. So in the following few slides, we're talking a little bit about uh, the examples uh, of uh, all, the, uh, uh, all, all the different uh, uh, kind of formulations. So for directing, pr direct predicting the solutions, uh, what you see is uh, there's a lot of papers that uh, starting from 2015 uh, that try to use uh, sequence to sequence models uh, that to predict directly uh, the solution of the uh, of the of the problem. Right. So in these cases, uh, you spe specify like what is the solution. You send them to uh, sequence to sequence models, and automatically it will give you the solution without any search and without any refinements. Right. But these are actually like the first uh, trials of uh, using uh, machine learning for computer information problems. Right. So after that, 
people realize that uh, I mean the, these problems are hard, and uh, you cannot just use that to solve it. There's a lot of uh, other way to uh, formulate it. So one way that we have been thinking about is uh, the local rewriting framework, in which we are trying to uh, starting from a feasible solution and iteratively converge to a good solution. So in this case, we basically pick a local solution, and then we pick a small components, and then we use a, a, a rule, a pick a rule to change this small component so that uh, that uh, solution become better, and then we repeat this process. So we find that this actually this approach actually quite effective, and we show that it's actually doing well compared to a bunch of other uh, baselines. So in different uh, problems like uh, online job scheduling experience implication, uh, and also uh, uh, yeah, vehicle routings. So by the way, the code is already online. If people are interested, uh, you can take a look. And this paper is being uh, accepted in a lot, it's New York's uh, 2019. So, and then we'll come back to this original uh, question, right? So we have all these different way of formulating the action space, and we usually fix them. Uh, when uh, we start with uh, uh, when we start with solving this optimization problems, right? So, but the question becomes why we want to predefine the action space, right? So, why not we actually learn the action space uh, in these optimization procedures, right? So, this is the key difference between optimization problems and uh, the MDPs that is uh, formulated by games. Right. So for optimization problems, we only care about the final solution. We don't really care how we get it. Right. So we act, this actually leave additional room for us to learn the representation of the action space so that the form the, the optimization can be uh, done better. So this actually uh, to actually show this is the case. Uh, one example I uh, I really like is this form this this following example. Right. So uh, here we basically want to show that okay, what is the effect of representation of action space uh, for the efficiency of the uh, of search accuracy, right? So here's like a one example in the architecture space, architecture search space. So in which we have uh, 1,364 networks, each with different depths, a different number of channels, and also different kernel sizes. And the goal here is to find a network with the best accuracy using the fewest trials. Okay, so I mean, you definitely can do things like a, a random search or a train a reinforcement agent, whatever, right? So, but here we want to emphasize, okay, what is the uh, emphasize the, the importance of uh, representation in of the action space? If you consider the two action spaces, like the first one is the sequential one, that is uh, the normal one we, we usually think about, right? So, okay, uh, here we have a bunch of networks with different uh, depths and different channels. Okay, the sequential action will be okay. We first add this first layer. And set as kernel size as well as the channel size. And then we add another layer, set as kernel size and channel size, etc. Until we say stop and the network is um, uh, forming, and we can use the network to train uh, the uh, to, 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 to get this performance, and then we get a, get, get a number in, in terms of accuracy. Right. So, but we can also think about a different way of constructing this action space, which is called the global action space. So in that case, we first set the depth of a network, okay, and then we set the uh, kernel size as well as channel size at each uh, layer of the network. Okay, so we can actually see that, uh, I mean, these two action spaces actually uh, do uh, perform much different uh, in the uh, in actual the, the, the curves. So this here is like a, a curve that shows that clear the x axis is the number of samples. And the number of networks you want to sample and evaluate, and the y-axis is uh, the the amount of accuracies, right? So how much the best accuracy you could be uh, after you already have uh, uh, a, a few hundred examples. So ideally, we want that curve to be uh, go straight to the highest accuracy ever as soon as possible. Right? So this is basically the, the ideal case. So we can see that uh, I mean the global one is actually doing much better uh, than the sequential ones. That's actually very interesting. I mean, intuitively that makes sense because uh, human, uh, when human does all this uh, uh, decision-making process, human is not really uh, thinking about details first. Right? Human always think, okay, uh, maybe the depth of the network is the most important one. So we want to make sure that the depth is being decided first. 
Okay, we say all the depth of network is important. So we are choose the, the like deep network first, and then we figure out the details. Right. So rather than starting from the details saying, okay, what is the kernel size and channel size of the first layer of network, which doesn't really matter that much. Right. So this is actually give you this kind of feeling that, okay, for optimization problems, maybe this ordering or in some sense, like what is the first the most important decision to make is the important part, rather than stick to a one MDP and then uh, solve for uh, this MDP, which may not be ideal. Right. So uh, here, uh, we want to go one step further, right? So we, instead of like choosing between uh, multiple action spaces, we might even think about like, what is the, is that a way to actually automatically learn uh, this action space, right? So that's actually a very interesting uh, component. So what do I mean by learn action space? This basically means that uh, you, if you think about this search tree uh, in, the, uh, in this game environment, then what happens, you actually change the semantics of the edges in this search tree, right? So which is not allowed in games for sure, because in games, uh, each action uh, is well-defined, but it's doable in optimization because uh, in optimization, there's no well-defined way of uh, search space, uh, of the action space and, uh, um, yeah, and, uh, and, and, and a state space, and you can define by yourself. Okay, so then like this basically introduced the first part of this talk that says like, okay, how can we learn the action space? In this, in the two recent papers that have been published in uh, Europe 2020, as well as TPAMI 2021. So we actually think about a way to uh, learn the action space. So here the action is defined as the partition of this uh, search space, right? So suppose like uh, all this uh, architectures are in this small and this like huge search space, then the, partition, uh, the, the action now becomes like how we should partition uh, the search space so that uh, the partition is uh, in favor of uh, a very efficient search. Uh, so that's basically like the, the way to define this action space. So what is the criteria for defining this action space? So here's like a, a, the, the figure that you can visualize uh, with uh, these two different uh, uh, action uh, space that the global one and the sequential one, as I mentioned before, right? So we can see that the global under the global action space, what happens is uh, the the search tree is kind of uh, well aligned uh, with the performance of the model, right? So uh, in the global action space, you can see that for all the some trees, some branches actually contain like a very bad accuracy performance models, and some other branches actually consider uh, contain like a good models. Right, so, and the, but in the sequential action space, the, all this like good or bad model, they are mingled together uh, into uh, different uh, branches of, this, of the tree. So we don't, we don't really want this uh, sequential uh, model splitting because this basically means that we have to go to, into every search uh, tree branch in order to uh, find uh, the good uh, and models. Right, so that's actually uh, not good. And this actually will uh, waste us a lot of time and efforts and uh, computation resources in order to get a good model. What we really want is this global action space so that uh, the good models are clustered around into, uh, into this subtree. And uh, the bad models are also in another branch of subtree so that you can just prove them away. You say, okay, this branch does not work at all, then we should not spend too much time, efforts, and in order to uh, search that branch. Right. So this actually give us like the motivation, also the criteria, how we should uh, partition the, the, the space and also construct the action space. So, and then like, uh, this is like a one example of uh, how we can learn this action space. Uh, here's like an example with just two dimensional, uh, uh, two dimensional uh, uh, space. So suppose the network is only parameterized by number of filters as well as the number of the depths. Right, so in that case, like for there, you're going to get have get a bunch of samples, and some samples have a high accuracy. Samples actually have a lower accuracy, and then you can actually learn a linear classifier or whatever classifier you want, in order to uh, split like the, the the good ones versus from the bad ones, and you can use that learned uh, linear classifiers as. Uh, the way to partition the space into the good part of the space, uh, the, uh, the, the subspace, and also the bad part of the subregions, right? So then you split this uh, environment into left and the right 
uh, branches. And the left one is basically saying, okay, I'm choosing to pick the, the good uh, action space. And the right one is you're, I'm choosing to pick the right, the bad uh, action space. Okay. And then we can do this iteratively and, until you form like the tree. You can get this uh, also in this into this hierarchical manner. And uh, uh, you don't, you are not uh, restricted to use uh, uh, a linear uh, classifier or linear partition. You can also use a nonlinear boundary uh, in order to separate the good from bad. So the, the idea here is uh, you want these good branches to be always on the left so that uh, when you explore the space, you actually will use uh, that uh, good, uh, you always basically focus yourself into these small good regions. But at the same time, you also have other branches that are not that great, but you also want them in order to explore the space. And uh, you can pick some regions that are actually uh, promising in the, in the in a later stage. Okay, so uh, given this component, then we have this, like, uh, this entire uh, algorithm called the uh, latent space many car tree search. So in that uh, approach, what happens is uh, you first uh, use the initial uh, random sample data to train the action space. And then once you have this action space learned, you search uh, using this learned action space and here a fixed number of rows are being used. So here we are using basic many car tree search uh, to uh, do this uh, kind of uh, splitting. And also you get like a more data so that you can go come back to this, uh, the first stage that you can train this action space. Okay. So the reason why we're using Minkart tree search exploration is also important because at the beginning, uh, you might be able to get trapped into local minima uh, to say, okay, the left one is also good. And you get like a bunch of samples that are reasonably good, but not optimal. While the actual optimal or very good solutions may actually hiding uh, into uh, regions uh, that are not that great, right? So maybe more, the majority of the part here are really bad so that the, the, this entire region appear to be a bad uh, region, but it actually contain a very important and interesting part that is the optimal solution. So you still need some exploration. So, so you have to basically use some samples along that path to explore that subspace, sub regions in order to uh, keep finding like a good, uh, good, good points. Uh, for, 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 for us to use in the future. So now like we uh, focus on like uh, talk about the performance of this uh, of these models, right? So uh, I think uh, we basically we, I basically use that to uh, to test whether it works well in like uh, architecture search that's actually one of the first uh, motivation at the beginning to see whether this approach is working. So we actually construct a few data sets. And we see that whether this approach is doing well in different data sets. So what you see is uh, uh, when we actually using a large and larger data set, the performance of this approach compared to the other approaches uh, like a base optimization or random or, uh, or like other approach for, many uh, for uh, neural network architecture search is actually much better. So uh, you can actually see that when data sets become larger, and until we reach to this NAS Bench 101, which contains 420K models, it's already pre-trained on Cypher 10 data set by Google. And we see that our approach actually is doing much better compared to the other approaches in terms of this number of accuracies, right? So how fast accuracy grows given the number of samples that you need in order to achieve better models. So we also try this in open domains and we show that our approach can achieve uh, pretty good top one errors uh, with uh, only like a 800 number of trials. Okay, so we also try this approach uh, in uh, black box optimization in which uh, uh, you don't have an architect network, but you only have a black box function you want to call, right? So, and in that case, like we can actually show that with this approach, uh, our uh, sample complexity is much higher. Uh, sample uh, efficiency is much higher uh, compared to this existing solvers, which is when it's called Tubo, it just calls it a base optimization. And we see that uh, uh, with our approach, uh, the curve is the solid curve. The solid curve is like drops much faster in terms of the function values because it's minimizing a function compared to uh, other, other cases. So we also try this approach in uh, optimizing and not linear policies for module tasks. And we show that uh, with, if you have a lot of uh, dimensions in this optimization problems, 
I mean, this approach actually do uh, much better compared to the rest of this evolutional optimization uh, problems. Okay, so we also apply that to multi-objective optimization problems. And uh, recently we see this is also showing good performance uh, compared to the uh, previous uh, approaches. Okay, so and this code is open source, and uh, if people are interested in uh, using it, uh, feel free to click the link, and uh, and uh, it should be easy to use. And you can simply define a function, a bubble function, and put that into uh, this uh, uh, code, uh, um, and then it will basically give you uh, good solutions in a short amount of time. And uh, our approach has been used uh, in a third place and place team in last year's Europe 2020 Black Box Optimizer Competition. Okay, so, and then like uh, here I'll come to the second part of the talk, which is uh, how can we find representations for easier search? So for this, uh, um, we're aiming for like a different, uh, uh, different domain, which is basically uh, search in imperfect information games. And so I think for this one, uh, so we first want to, this is like basically one slide that shows the difference between uh, perfect information games and imperfect information games. So you basically show like the left hand is a tree that people will often encounter in the perfect information games in which like, there's basically no cycles. And uh, once you start from here, you make one decisions, you go into the left branch of the tree, and then uh, you can, that branch of the tree has nothing to do with this right branch of the tree, and et cetera. <laughs> Right. So that's basically like the, what happens in the information game and also what happens for uh, people thinking about like search based approaches. That's very clear. But uh, for imperfect information games, uh, things are a little bit different. And uh, so uh, the reason why this is the case is uh, uh, you might have two players, right? So player one here, player two there. And uh, one player, what is visible to one player may not be visible uh, for other players. Uh, so because of that, what happens is uh, you might see like uh, these two nodes are very basically being spitting around for one player, uh, maybe actually is one node for another player. Right? So this basically means that each of this, um, uh, each of this player, each of the player actually see like partial information and uh, they may not be able to distinguish between them and make decisions. Here's like one example about this imperfect information game. Uh, so for example, you only have two cards Right, so you give like one private card to player one and the other player, uh, player, uh, private card to player two. So there are four possible possibilities, right? So zero, zero, all the way to one, one. Right, so, and then you can say, okay, if uh, you are basically the, the game designer, you have complete information, then you actually can distinguish all these four possibilities, right? So, and uh, this will be the history of this game. However, if you think from the perspective of player one and player two, they actually see very different things, right? So from, from, the from the perspective of player one, you only see like two possible cases, right? So in the possible, the first case cases is uh, it, the player one only hold a card of zero. The second case is the player one only hold a card of one. Right. So, and uh, you, you don't have to see any cases because the player one does not really see the, the, the other people's player, uh, other people's card. Right. So, and also the same thing happens in, in the player two, two cases. Right. The player two only always see two cases as well. Right. So the, the, the first case is like he is being uh, getting the card of uh, zero. The second case is um, he got a card of one. Right. So you get basically you have this kind of info, this is a concept called this information set. Right. So basically means that uh, you can only have a policy that is consistent and also constant within this uh, region, uh, which is the information set. Okay. So because of that structure, this is the reason why we actually see uh, these circles here. Right. So if you treat this information set as this uh, single node in uh, the, the search tree, then what do you see is that you're going to see the search tree as you have this kind of circles. Uh, in this manner, because what is distinguishable from player one may not be distinguishable from player two. So you have this kind of like a weird structure in these imperfect information games. And uh, you're going to see more if you have more actions, right? So for example, for that action, if suppose like player one has action A and B, and for different A, action A and B, you're going to split this information set into two, four different information sets corresponding to eight different complete information uh, histories. 
So uh, this is the game condition that this action is public. So that everyone can see it and everyone can use that action to split these two information sets from two to four. So this is actually uh, makes things a little bit complicated. And uh, how can we actually do search is one of the very hard problems we need to face uh, for these kind of situations. Okay. And what makes things even harder uh, is, uh, is that, uh, I mean, for uh, in many cases, you cannot just optimize in just one node at a time because this will also lead to local optimum. So this is actually like one problem in this uh, uh, a collaborative in perfect information games, right? So here's like one simple example that shows this is the case. So suppose we have two agents uh, who are communicating with each other, and uh, they are they can speak both French and English, right? But uh, the the problem with uh, this kind of communication is uh, because they don't know each other's card or who is uh, who is good at French, who is good at English. So they may, may, may get like a fixed into uh, local minimum, right? For example, they are both speak French, but actually there's one solution uh, that is even better, which is uh, both are speaking English. Maybe that, that are better, but none of this, uh, neither of these agent are able to switch unilaterally uh, their policies in order to achieve better solution. Because uh, if one of the agent actually switch the policy, then uh, the, the communication will break. And then both of them will receive minus one or very negative rewards. Only if both of these agents switch their policies at the same time, they are able to uh, able to basically get like a much better uh, solutions, right? So this actually makes things even more complicated because uh, in order to get a good policies, you actually need to find uh, a good improvements for both of them at the same time. So this can be basically represented by this uh, very simple uh, diagram that shows there are two information sets for these two players, and uh, they need to basically change their policies at the same time in order to achieve uh, a better solution. Otherwise, you get you might get to like a non, uh, the local national equivalents. Okay, so in order to achieve that, uh, there's a, like a, actually like a bunch of different ways of doing that, right? So one thing we can think about is that it's a very naive formulation in which uh, you might say, okay, how about uh, we just pick a subtree and we do, do like a local improvements, right? So, and then like we might need to pick like multiple information sets in order to and change their policies in order to jump out of the local minimum, right? So then but the problem is like, uh, because of this complicated structure of uh, this, uh, uh, this, this game tree, that is actually not a tree, but it's a, a DAG, uh, things have become like a kind of very complicated. Right. So the reason why it's complicated is uh, this is the following uh, slides. So the, the reason why this is the case is that you actually have a dependencies between uh, different policies, right? So for example, uh, in imperfect information gain, what happens is uh, you might see there's a history that go out of this information set all the way and go back to this information set that is in the mainstream, that is in the changing in this active information set you want to change their policies, right? So this actually makes things very complicated uh, because uh, in order to trace all these uh, uh, histories, which is these black dots, so that this, in a trace like the, the changes after you make changes to the policy, you have to basically go back and trace like whether all these uh, histories are being uh, visited and being like used in all these uh, information sets whose policies may have been changed. Uh, this, this actually is complicated, but fortunately, what, uh, what can we do is that if we change the representation uh, for the uh, overall value changes uh, of, this, uh, uh, of these values, then we actually see like interesting and very nice formulations. So that, that prevents you from tracking all these uh, uh, histories uh, hold this like histories over this entire tree. Uh, so basically like uh, what we do in this paper is that uh, we actually compose a policy chain density. And that is actually has nice properties. First of all, that density is, um, if you add this density together of, over all the possible histories in this entire game tree, then this will naturally represent the difference uh, between uh, the old policy game values and the new policy gain values. And the second property is that uh, for regions that policy doesn't change, 
in that region, no matter where they are, and the 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 the, the density is actually goes to zero. I uh, saw so for the the density basically goes to zero, no matter uh, whether the upstream or downstream policy has changed. So this actually these two properties actually is very nice. If you put them together, you actually will actually get like this new representation for value changes, right? So then the all value changes will be only depending on uh, the, the only the active information sets where the policies has been changed. And then you sum them together and you get this overall value changes. This is a very nice formulation so that uh, you can actually uh, do a much cleaner and search parroting in order to uh, find the, the better policies uh, that are in improvement of existing policies. And based on that, we can actually discover this uh, joint policy search algorithms. And that search algorithm is basically doing uh, uh, this kind of depth first search and uh, use that previous formula to actually compute how much changes between an old policy and a new policy after this policy change. And you can do this intuitively until uh, the, these approaches cannot find a better solution anymore. Okay, so we basically apply that idea uh, to multiple small scale games. And we can show that, I mean, if you combine this approach <laughs> with, the, uh, uh, with existing like a uh, policy iteration approaches, and our approach is actually doing uh, much better. Right, so we actually see that it can improve existing policies and also help it jump out of this local minima. Right, so this is basically the performance after you apply this JPS over the existing uh, policies that is learned that is also found by uh, the, this uh, uh, by the existing like policy improvement approaches. So we see that uh, this number is getting better than the previous numbers, and we can also even do like a sample based version of it. Uh, by not on, by basically uh, only sample like uh, the histories in each uh, information set rather than you all the possible uh, information all the possible histories. Okay, and uh, we can see that if the history if, if the number of samples you have uh, sampled is basically uh, is basically like a, 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 a above some threshold, then we actually see the performance get improved, and uh, and sometimes like a sampled version is actually better than the full version. Because the sample version actually breaks the symmetry and it's getting like even better performance. Finally, we actually apply this approach to contractive bridge, a contrast bridge and bidding. And we actually show that this approach can is able to get uh, a break these local optimal issues and able to uh, reach like a higher performance. So we are uh, uh, basically comparing against the W5, which is a champion of the computer bridge tournament in multiple years. Okay, so finally, uh, I'm, we'll spend like the last uh, 15 minutes, uh, uh, that's the last part, that is the representation uh, for our exploration. So that part is basically like, a, I basically first talk about our paper, which is called the B-Bold. And in this B-Bold paper, we actually uh, talk about, uh, uh, propose like a new way of explore the entire uh, space of this, uh, of the, in the reinforcement learning settings. So basically, in, we actually have a very simple uh, uh, criteria uh, for the our, our exploration, and we show that that criteria is actually doing uh, very well, right? So uh, in many kind of cases, so uh, this criteria is very simple. You basically say okay, this is the intrinsic reward you want to get, and uh, the intrinsic reward is basically composed of uh, several components, right? So first of all, you first have a trade trace. Give me a trade tree. You first compute this I and D scores uh, between uh, these two nearby states. So here you have ST and ST plus one, and uh, for I, so you first compute I and D score for uh, for this uh, nodes. You compute I and D score for that nodes, and then you subtract the two, and then you get the take the max of it, and also this also multiplied by the episodic variation count. So note that this I and D score is actually computed. Uh, as uh, a random network distillation. So you actually have uh, two networks. So one is the online network and the other is the random fixed target network. So uh, then like uh, you basically, what you do is uh, you, uh, you first train uh, an online network five prime given the previous existing states, right? So if you already visited that states, 
then the, diff the, the, the distance between these two networks output will be a uh, small and which means that uh, this is uh, this shows that that particular state has already been visited right so if you already if you have explored to a region so that the explore the, the states is uh, uh, the state has never been explored then what happens is that the, 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 there will be a huge gap between the output of the online network and the random network so that these two difference will be become huge. So this corresponds to the fact that uh, the, uh, the, 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 the number of variation counts uh, is small. Uh, so this is basically a way to, uh, to, to basically show uh, you actually have a better performance. Uh, sorry, the, the way you, you show that you actually uh, will have a lot of variations uh, in one state and uh, there's some other states that you are not familiar with. Okay, so in Bebo, like oh, the idea here is that uh, you basically want to uh, you basically want to check the trailer trace and see is there any kind of gap uh, between the vegetation counts difference, right? So if you have already explored the space that is uh, uh, in this left part, and uh, this space is uh, I mean this 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 space has been like a lot of vegetation counts there, and uh, if you go outside and the vegetation count will become small because there's a bottleneck here, and naturally. You are going to use these uh, gradients as a way to ver to to uh, as like a, a way to uh, giving like higher rewards in this bot for this bottleneck uh, nodes, right? So you get higher rewards here because uh, according to our criteria, right? This two this will be approximated the variation counts, the inverse of variation counts for t plus one, and this one will be the variation counts for t. If there's a huge gap between the two, which means that there's a bottleneck state. There and you basically assign them with higher rewards so that exploration will become easier uh, to to achieve, right? So once you achieve the high rewards, and uh, the agents will be attempt to uh, get into this place. So once the agent actually already learn how to get to these bottleneck uh, regions, and then uh, the vegetation counts of this uh, bottleneck states will become higher, and uh, naturally this gap will diminish over time. And then uh, you're going to uh, not focusing on that part, and we'll be focusing on the second, uh, uh, the, the the next uh, bottleneck uh, regions, uh, so that uh, the, uh, the exploration can go further. Okay, so that's basically like the major idea of this uh, Bebo paper, and you can actually see that we, although like this paper is uh, this uh, idea is very simple, it actually does a much good job in many uh, situations. So I think one of these interesting uh, experiments that people have already seen and we already did conducted is uh, the experiment on this mini grid. So what, what we can see is uh, uh, we can see this approach actually does very well in uh, many of these uh, hard tasks in mini grid environments, right? So, and uh, uh, we see that for all these 12 hard challenging environments and the people actually do much better uh, than existing approaches uh, including uh, right and also Migo. And uh, we actually see that, uh, I mean, all these people can actually solve all these uh, situations within 120 million steps. So here's like a bunch of figures that shows that, uh, I mean, uh, in hard, especially in the hard task, people actually does uh, much better and able to solve them in, uh, an, uh, in like less than a million uh, environment steps, which is actually very interesting. This is a very simple, uh, 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 criteria is actually doing a very, uh, very effective uh, approach. So we can also show that if we do pure exploration in mini grid using this B bold environment, in, using this B bold criteria compared to the IND criteria, we see that this B bold criteria actually do much better in terms of exploring uh, this entire environment, while the IND might get stuck in this uh, in a few rooms and then never come back. The problem with IND is that uh, it's basically uh, get stuck with somewhere because um, uh, once it gets uh, familiar with uh, some rooms, uh, then it might choose to go back to the previous rooms because the previous room appear to be less familiar compared to the, the current room. And then you're going to see this kind of back and forth uh, phenomena uh, using this IND uh, framework. But we both actually was able to uh, get rid over that and uh, explore more rooms in a fewer number of environment steps. Okay, and we also then an ablation study on showing like what are the 
so basically the important component for each of these design choices, right? So for example, like uh, the max is important and also this episodic uh, vegetation counts is also important in order to achieve good performance. We also achieve, uh, we also uh, apply this big old uh, exploration task to NetHack, uh, which is uh, a nice environment uh, conducted, uh, developed by, uh, uh, by uh, FAIR London, uh, by team and also Ed about that. I think that's a very nice environment to, to, work, to, to work on. And we show that uh, Bebo is actually doing well in um, multiple tasks uh, in these uh, environments. And we also show that uh, our approach is uh, doing uh, well in the revenge without having a lot of uh, interesting, uh, a lot of like handcrafted uh, features. Okay, but finally, uh, recently we also start to think about like oh, how can we, uh, if we change the representation uh, with Bbot, then what will happen? Right. So one interesting thing that we actually perceive is that. Uh, Bebo is actually very sensitive to uh, different uh, kind of uh, uh, features used in the uh, in the IND uh, part, right? So if we use random features, then uh, we see that uh, this is a nice curve going up, right? So uh, for when if we have more environment uh, uh, steps, however, if we are using a different uh, representation of the uh, for the vegetation counts, uh, then what happens here? is that you're going to, for example, if you use this uh, double uh, by simulation control, or uh, you are using ICM features, then what happens is that you're going to see like a very bad performance. It doesn't really go up at all, right? But if we use the successor representation, then the performance actually drops, uh, goes even faster uh, with uh, more, uh, uh, with like, uh, uh, with more environment steps. So this is actually quite interesting. So one thing we are suspecting here is, uh, in theory, depends on the quality of the representation. Of the representation, if the representation can uh, actually efficiently uh, give you a nice hint and ideas about uh, this environment, right? so then this representation is, is actually good. So one thing, one thing we have already observed is uh, for successful representation, what happens is uh, uh, with uh, the successful representation, uh, you're going to see the similar uh, representation within each room, but the very different representation if you go between rooms. So because of that interesting feature, then it actually essentially like a, a make this uh, MDP from like a 10 to 10, maybe 10 to 10 like a grids back to maybe like a, a smaller MDPs so that uh, each of the states is approximately represents a room rather than a single cell. Uh, so this actually gives uh, uh, a lot of uh, convenience and freedom, right? So, and also like uh, make this uh, uh, exploration uh, much more efficient. So that is actually a very nice uh, part of the representation. So we are still exploring towards this direction uh, in order to find the, 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 uh, a good representation in order to achieve uh, um, even better performance uh, for Bboard. Okay, so thanks for your attention. And uh, I will leave the rest uh, uh, 80 minutes uh, for any uh, questions.